Well, hello and welcome. Welcome to the Gulbenkian Theatre and the, to the University of Kent campus. Our guest tonight is an extraordinary woman. Uh, we all know her from her television appearances, but she's also the author of, I think, 14 cookery books and eight novels uh -huh. at last count. She ran a Michelin-starred restaurant in Notting Hill. Uh, she founded a school of food and wine in the UK and a chef's academy in her native South Africa. She's run numerous businesses of various kinds. She's written uh, cookery and food columns for newspapers, and she loves a challenge. I know this because also on her CV, uh, she tried through the School Food Trust to improve school lunches, which is something we might talk about. And back in 1977, she joined the British Railways Board to try to improve <laughs> British Railways <laughs> catering. Uh, we might get into that. We might not bother. Um, <laughs> please, will you welcome Dame Prue Lee. Thank you. And I didn't mention Great British Bake Off because they all will. So I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about other things. Can we, can we start where, where you started, I suppose, in, in South Africa? I mean, t tell us a little bit about growing up, your background, and, and where, where the food came in, I guess. <laughs> well, I grew up in, in apartheid South Africa. So I, I was part of a very, um, very liberal and um, loving, but privileged white South African family. So I never cooked at all. We had a cook, a wonderful guy, uh, Charlie, he was called. He was Zulu. And he cooked like a dream. But it never occurred to either of my parents, or therefore to me, that I could learn to cook at Charlie's apron strings. So lovely food arrived on the tables. I ate it. I was always greedy. So I was always interested in food. But it never occurred to me, not until I got to university in France, and I realized that food, to make food, requires real um, effort and um, care. And it's very interesting. I mean, food is very interesting. And I hadn't thought of that. I just thought it was something lovely you ate. <laughs> and that, that, that is amazing, because South African food, as you would know better yeah, than any yeah. of us, actually, is wonderful. I mean, the produce is wonderful. The wine's wonderful. Yeah. The cuisine can be wonderful, too. It certainly become very wonderful. I mean, when I was growing up, it was much more <coughs> sort of British colonial. It was oh. quite heavy. And the, the, the food was wonderful if it was a barbecue, a braai, a braai place, or if it was outside picnicky or salads. I mean, we had wonderful salads and lovely cold food. But, I mean, at, on Christmas Day, we would still have... the. It would be blazing sunshine in, in Johannesburg, and we would have turkey and plum pudding and <laughs> mince pies and port and right. warm sherry on the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they didn't really have much clue. <laughs> so w w when you were in Paris, did, did, did the light just suddenly go on? I mean, was there one meal or one <clears throat> restaurant? Um, I don't think it was so much one meal. It was this, the thing about that people talked about food in France. The French talk about food all the time, they still do. And they're obsessed with food, but in a really good way. They're, they're interested in it. They would, you'd have, in a, in a brasserie or a bar, you would have the, a captain of industry talking to a metro worker, and they would be discover, discussing, you know, where the best steak was, or, what, or, you know, how chips should be made, or, you know, it was really universal interest. And I think the thing that, it, that one of the things that did it for me was that I was standing in a student queue in, um, in one of the sort of cafeteria, student cafeteria self serve things. And there were these um, little dishes that the French have for first courses, you know, a few little beans and a bit of vinaigrette. And, the, and, um, and anyhow, one of these first course dishes was about five radishes or four radishes. You know those French breakfast ones that have pink, mm -hmm. pink tips and but a few leaves still on, on them? And, and then there was a, a screw of, of salt in a bit of paper, a dab of butter and a piece of bread. And I said to the guy next to me, that's not food. That's sort of <laughs> garnish, you know. That's, that, you know. What's that for? And then he said, it's delicious. And he said, have some. And so we, I bought some, and we went and sat down. And he said, he told me what to do. He said, grab the, grab the radish, 
stroke it through the butter so that you get a bit of butter on it, dip it in mm -hmm. the salt, put it in your mouth, and, and eat it. And, it. and I suddenly thought that's, that's the sort of secret of food. It's really fresh ingredients, mm -hmm. not messed around, and served with things that really go with them, like a little bit of mm -hmm. good butter and, and fleur de sel. And but when, when you say that, I was, uh, almost was thinking it was like a, a kind of religious experience, and yet you came to Britain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was because I couldn't afford. <laughs> I couldn't afford to get, go to the Cordon Bleu in France because it was too expensive. And so I came to the Cordon Bleu in London. Uh -huh. And of course, the Cordon Bleu in London was a really good school. Mm -hmm. Is still a good, a very good school, and so and I had to bluff my way in because I couldn't have my my poor father. I mean, I had I had tried. <coughs> I'd been to university in Cape Town, and I'd I'd had to go to drama school because I thought I'd be an actress like my mum, and then I thought that was no good, and so I went to art school, and that and I was no good at that, and then I went to architecture school, and then I went and started a BA. So by the time I kept, got to France, my father was pretty tired of my changing my mind. And so, uh, anyhow, I did manage to persuade him that, no, I really meant it this time, that I was going to be a cook. And so I went to, to but he would only pay for me to do a three-month course. And so I went to the Cordon Bleu and said, I wanted to do the advanced course. It didn't seem to me much point in having a certificate that said that you were a beginner cook or an intermediate cook. I thought I wanted to be an advanced cook. But anyhow, so they said, well, you can't come into the advanced course unless you have done our intermediate and our beginner's course, or unless you worked in a, in a restaurant. So I said, but I've worked in a restaurant in Paris. I've been in Paris for a year, and I've been working at this restaurant. And so they let me in. But I had never been in the kitchen. I mean, I, <laughs> I was a bit economical with the truth. You're a chancer. <laughs> ah, I know, naughty. <laughs> well, but... To make the leap between loving food and understanding, you know, French cuisine can be very simple but fresh and so on, mm -hmm. to actually running a restaurant, running your own business, mm -hmm. that is a whole different I ball know. game, isn't it? And, and, and talk about fools rushing in. I mean, I wanted to have a restaurant because I, I, I had this absolute burning desire to have a restaurant. And I wanted the kind of restaurant that I would love to go to because in those days, we're talking about the 60s in, in London. Restaurants were either um, really rubbish. They were, um, you know, sort of fun bistros, but the food was terrible. Mm -hmm. Or they were very smart um, hotels with white tablecloths and head waiters that looked down <coughs> his nose at you if you if you dared to order the house wine, mm -hmm. you know, because you just were frightened of the waiters. I mean, what a way to run a restaurant. And the food was all reheated. You know, it was mostly pre-cooked and reheated in gravy. And vegetables came around in stainless steel compartmental dishes. <laughs> and a waiter dolloped, you know, two kinds of potato and some cabbage. It didn't matter what you'd ordered. You could have salmon or... <laughs> and it, so I just thought, you were, I wanted to have a really smart restaurant that was where the waiters were, were friendly and where the food was delicious. And so, but I'd never been in this restaurant. It was in my head. And so I ended up in the end. I had I run the catering company by then. I started with just cooking, being a cook for hire, going around cooking mm -hmm. people's dinner parties. Mm -hmm. And then I got together enough money to open a restaurant. So I did. And I had never even worked in a restaurant. But I had the temerity to think that I should be able to run one. And the long and the short of it was, I couldn't. I mean, I, it was, the restaurant was fantastic. It was packed. We went, you know, full night after night. And, and also the other thing I had decided was that there would be one price, because I thought the point about going to a restaurant is partly the food, but the other part is the experience. Mm -hmm. And so what you should really pay for is sitting on that seat. So I decided you could, the price was two pounds, 12 and sixpence. <laughs> Well, that would be 50 quid today. Um, but you could eat as much as you liked. It was four courses, but I didn't mind if you only ate one course. You still paid the same. So that was quite unusual. And I had no rules about what you should wear. You know, in, those in those days, restaurants insisted that you wore jackets and ties, and they wouldn't let you in if you didn't. And I mean, I, 
And I've always thought it's monstrous to take somebody's money and then tell them how to behave. Mm. You know. Anyway, so I, I um, had this rather unusual restaurant, but it was very, very popular. But I was losing money, and I was losing money fast. And I realized I was going to go bust in four months if, if it went on like that. So I thought I'd better meet some other restaurateurs who know <laughs> how to do this. So I joined the Restaurateurs Association, and I went to a party they gave in, on the House of Commons steps, you know, terrace. And there I met Albert Roux um, of, of the Roux Brothers fame, fame and the Gavroche, who owned Gavroche, and another guy called Joseph Berkman, who owned a whole sling of restaurants, three or four five, or more, more restaurants. And I got chatting to him, to these two, and I said, I'm losing money, I need help. And they said, you can't be, you're absolutely packed, you charge a fortune, we've been there, the food's lovely. You know, you can't be losing money. And I said, well, I am, and I don't know why. So they said they'd come and help. And do you know, they both did, and uh, um, Joseph Berkman came first, and he looked at my books, and he took one look in my office, and he ran his, you know, in those days it was, you know, you were, you, you're too young to know any of these. <laughs> uh, there were 37 columns in, in a big analysis mm -hmm. book. And they looked, he looked down these columns and he said, your chef is, ro is robbing you blind. And I have to tell you that he was Austrian, this guy. And I drew myself up and I said, he can't be, he's English. <laughs> That's not the thing to say to an Austrian. And anyway, what kind of racist remark is that? <laughs> anyway, he said, he is. And sure enough, um, he was. And then Albert Roux came along, and I thought he'd do the same, come into my office and look at the books. But he went into the kitchen, and he stood by the rubbish bins. And he, then he summoned me in, and he said, um, your profits are going in this bin. Mm, that's and I said, no, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, I have to give a lot, because we, ch we charge a lot, and, and it's all you can, we don't want to be mean. And he said, no, nobody wants to be overfaced with half a duck. And, that much veg and first courses and you know, he said just halve all the portions and he said anyway you're throwing away half your food and he jammed his hand into the bin and he pulled out an apple and he said um, what is the matter with this apple why is it in the bin and I took it from him rather embarrassed thought oh my god don't say we've thrown away a perfectly good apple and I turned it around and it was bad and so I'm very relieved I said Albert it's bad he said, no, 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 it is only one third bad. <laughs> and he took a little knife and he cut out the one third and he said, and he said, well, what are these water watercress stalks doing in the bin? And because the, we used to get watercress with a rubber band around it, lots of stalks. And we would chop off the tops and use mm -hmm. them and throw away the... And he said, there's more flavour in the watercress stalks than there is in the leaves and they should be going in the soup. And, he, and on and on like that. And he really, he taught me a lot about how to run a kitchen. It's a really tough business, though. I know we've got some questions from the audience, including one about precisely that, actually. Uh, where was it? Um, yeah, the habits and approaches do you look to implement in a professional kitchen? Because oh. some, yeah, cause some of it can be quite oh, Gavin. heated. We well, say? I think it's a bit of a hobby horse for me because, because I had never worked in the restaurant business, I knew nothing about the reputation and the way kitchens at the time worked, which were absolutely brutal. I mean, you know, it, it, there was a sort of, they, they would talk about it as if it was an army thing, because it was all about discipline. You know, you talk about a kitchen brigade and they, they, mm -hmm. you talk about the mess room and so on. And so it had, and the idea was that, I mean, chefs were, head chefs were gods and they were Nobody, on, nobody was allowed to say anything in the kitchen except we chef, we chef. And, and I didn't know that. So I ran a kitchen which was full of women for a start, very friendly, we were all friends, we all went to the pub together, we all, it was a nice, and it worked. I mean, it didn't work, we didn't make worse food just because we, nobody bullied anybody. Mm. You didn't have to intimidate people no, to get them to. No, I didn't have to. And in fact, along the short of it is, people will work for you if they believe in you, mm -hmm. and if they think, um, you know, there are other ways to getting respect than, than being horrible to people. And so, 
I, I feel quite strongly about this. And at one point, I became chairman of the Restaurateurs Association, which is a bit of a joke because all these other people were men. But they, uh, for some reason, I managed to get to be the chairman. And I, I used to say that I used to give talks, you know, all over the place about how I, I would use this phrase. I'd say, look, we are desperate for good cooks. Frightening people makes their brain shut down. You cannot learn if you're frightened. And we need people to stay in the business. What's, what are they, why wouldn't somebody go and work for Tesco rather than mm -hmm. you know, where they're on a there's, a... there's a career path and there's a buddy to help them when they first arrive and they, and they listen to and all the rest of it. And we don't do any of that. And, we, and we'll lose these people. And, you know, and I lecture them in this motherly manner. And then... I found myself one day saying, I just don't believe in the Gordon Ramsay School of Management. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next sec second, um, there's an article in the Evening Standard with Gordon Ramsay saying, well, of course Prue doesn't um, believe in discipline in the kitchen because she, you know, she, she cooks for nice little dinner parties. And anyhow, he just dissed me, good and proper. Um, but he said, the thing is, and, and actually there's truth in this, he said, I'm running, my kitchen is like Manchester United. I don't have to, I don't have to go out and look for cooks. They queue at the door to come to work for me. So I can just choose the best and I expect them to know what, the, what is expected of them before they come in. I'm not there to teach them, they're not children. And you know, it's, it's like a football team. You're either good enough or you're yeah. out. But that only works if you're already a top, top restaurant. And actually, to be fair to Gordon, he is nothing like as nasty in real life as he looks on television. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, I mean, Angela Hartnett would not have worked for him for 11 years if he was a bastard. Angela Hartnett is delightful, uh, lovely woman. And, um, but... That brings us to television mm. and uh, the impact. Actually, let's start with you in television and how you got on, because you weren't exactly a natural at the start, were you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't. No, uh, Perhaps because of the producers uh, and directors. Yeah, didn't well, exactly. Help. No, I got my first television job because I had been doing a Believe It or Not, the Today programme, which was going 50 years ago. Um, they used to have a little slot, on radio, obviously, a Today programme, a little slot on Fridays for about two minutes or three minutes, which was me telling the nation what to buy for the weekend or what to eat at the weekend or what to cook for the weekend. And the, and the director, I mean, the, the presenter was Jack DeManio. And Jack DeManio was a very great character in those days. Um, and he, he used to drink like a fish. And so... He could never get the time right, and so he would say, "The time is precisely eight twenty-five, and it was seven twenty-five or something." So, so finally, they sacked him, and he went off to work in Tyne T's Television, which was very new television um, company, and in Newcastle, and he had a program which they called, ironically, Black Jack Demanio, precisely. <laughs> um, and he wanted me to do the little cookery slot on it. And I said, lovely. And so I um, agreed to this. And then a week before we were due to start filming, the director rang me up and said, um, I would have bad news is that um, Jack DiManio has um, uh, left. Um, and the good news is we'd like you to present it. I had never been on television. But guess what? I said, yes, I'd love to. Of course, of course I would. I mean, who wouldn't want to present a television show? So I did. And I hated it because I had, a, I had a director who wanted to have everything on autocue. So if Gavin was interviewing me, Gavin would have had all his questions written on a um, teleprompt or autocue um, underneath the camera. And I, as the, as the interviewee, would have all my answers written. So it was totally false and wooden and horrible. And I, had to, and, I, well, and I had to interview all these different people. And not only was everything on autocue, but it was 
really stressful because he was just a horrible director. He was much worse than any good Gordon Ramsay. And so I did that for 26 episodes, and then I never did it again. Mm. But I, I, for a minute, I thought, this, this is lovely and fun. And that was a, a moment when a, the floor manager, who was my only friend, I think on about episode 23 or 24, he said to me, you're t- still terrified, aren't you? And I, I said, yeah, I hate it. And he said, you know what, you should have one of these. And he gave me a pill. And I had no idea what it was, but I tell you, I'd have taken it. It wouldn't matter, you know, anything to make things better. And I took it, and it was a sort of double dose of Valium. And I loved it. I, said, I was so good, I thought I was being funny, and, and I coasted around, and I, you know, I just had a lovely time. And um, then my brother, who watched the show, said, what were you on? <laughs> Eyes are rolling. And, uh, so I didn't do telly again for ages and ages until I went on the Great British Menu. And yeah, and then you could be yourself, which yeah, is uh, yeah, exactly. can, I'm better at that. Can, can I ask a couple of serious questions about food? I mean, it's obvious uh, to most of us that standards in restaurants and things yeah. have changed, and it's it's wonderful, and there's so much variety and so on. But do you think? That uh, and there's plenty of TV shows now about yeah, yeah. how how to make yeah. everything much better. It's cheap telly. It's cheap. It is cheap telly, but people like the humanity yeah. of it. They yeah. like the yeah, contest. Yeah, of course. But but we seem to be um, still eating pretty rubbish food. Many of us mm. not cooking. I got a couple of statistics. A survey for the co-op found that the average evening meal in Britain is eaten in 21 minutes. A fifth of British families don't have a dining table to sit at. About half sit on the sofa and eat in front of the TV. Um, food service delivery is worth 8.5 billion, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And there was a couple of people who wrote in with questions about precisely that. Do, are we divided between rich and poor when it comes to food? I mean, mm. they're all rolled into one. But oh, w- w- Gavin, I can get on? very boring on the subject. Go ahead. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean... Uh, I, I've spent so much of my life saying the same thing. It's really depressing that I'm still saying it, mm. which is basically that if you don't teach children to eat, they will never be properly healthy, mm. and they won't teach their children to eat well. And that we'll have this sort of... And if we just let the manufacturers <coughs> run riot, they... they ha- if I was the marketing manager of the Mars bars, say, I would want you to eat at least two or three of them a day. My desire, everything about my job would be to sell more of the stuff. Mm. And the, the things manufacturers would like us to eat, and I'm generalizing, obviously, they're good manufacturers as well, but they uh, are made of fat, sugar, and salt. Those are the things that we're all easily wooed, that you know, it tickles our taste buds. And it ain't good for us. And if we don't teach children, we, we're not going to get it right. And I... I, I, I mean, I, when I was at the School Food Trust, we really made some serious advances. We got the government to understand that the obesity was connected to what you eat, and what you eat is connected to what you like to eat, and also what you can manage to cook. If you can't cook, you can't make something nutritious and delicious out of a ham hock and a, a stump of a cabbage and a, and a couple of onions. But if you can cook, you can. You can make a really nutritious soup out of that. But if you, so it's all about education. And while I was uh, on the School Food Trust, um, which was really stimulated by Jamie Oliver, because um, some of you will remember the Jamie Oliver's school dinners programs. Do you remember them? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that was brilliant because what happened then was Tony Blair watched that first program, which was about turkey twizzlers and the Mm -hmm. burgers going through the bars. Um, And he rang up Ruth Kelly, who was then the Minister of Education, and said, we've got to do something about school dinners. And we want to, I don't ever want to see another program like that. And she had the sense to say, if we don't change the law about what can be given to children to eat at school, and we'll never get anywhere, because if schools are not 
are motivated by trying to save money to buy computers, they will do it by running a tuck shop or by having vending machines which sell mm -hmm. nothing but Cokes and stuff. If we don't stop that stuff in schools, we will never change anything. So we did get managed to get that changed. And we, and we, and we made a huge amount of progress. We had um, dinner ladies being taught how to cook well, delicious and healthy food. We had uh, money going into kitchens and all sorts. But the fact is that if you, you can have any initiative uh, um, government-backed, it'll only work as long as the Secretary of State or the Minister in charge is behind it. As soon as he gets sacked or there's a general election, there's an immediate mm -hmm. desire to, to change things. No minister wants to pick up somebody else's baby and make it fly. They want to do their own job, do their own, mm -hmm. launch their own thing. And what happened with the School Food Trust is that the Tories got in and they had the bonfire of the Quangos, and we were one of them. However, there have been other good things, many, many other good things since. There's a wonderful um, thing that Henry Dimbleby runs called um, Chefs in Schools, which is a charity, and it does a mm -hmm. lot of good work. But no charity will ever crack the whole thing. We have to have... Government has to get behind it. Oh, because, because to go to the start of this bit of the conversation, you hit it absolutely correctly, because you cannot get a charity to take on people who are spending millions on advertising to yeah, sell absolutely. products. And it's fine that they do that, mm. but the, there has to be a way around it. And mm. part of it is teaching people um, to cook and also perhaps persuading uh, us all that it can be done without spending too much money. Can you could spend less, in fact. It, you know what? What is so interesting about this, I mean, I've just done a, a similar um, job for the this time for the on hospital food it's called mm. the hospital food review we did it just before lockdown <clears throat> and it was an enormous job of trying to um, establish what would really make hospital food um, first of all you know p um, patients have a miserable time in hospital so meals should be a pleasure it should be a moment of pleasure and of course they should we need doctors and, and the me medical profession to think of food as medicine because you're not going to get better if you're eating rubbish and so on. Anyhow, we, we came up um, and it was, a, it's a, it was a brilliant review. I, I was honestly really proud of it because we did it with nothing but M N NHS staff. NHS doctors or nutritionists, dietitians, administrators, caterers round the table, and all people who had done really well in their own hospitals or managed to get improvements and knew how to do it. So we, so we ended up with a good review with eight recommendations for, on everything from staff feeding so that staff weren't doing, you know, hold all night shifts and with nothing but a vending machine. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're on a 12 hour shift, you want to have more than a chocolate bar and a Coke for the middle of the night and so on. And all of that, I thought would be in absolute jeopardy because Matt Hancock managed to kiss himself goodbye. You remember? I'm so, not sure quite that's what happened, but anyway, <laughs> it, it was you were close. There were some of those words were right. <laughs> well, he did, and so I thought, ah, oh, there goes the school food review. It will not, uh, you know, because we'd got we'd got Boris Johnson behind it. We got uh, uh, Treasury. Everybody was all working, and I thought. We'll have the usual problem, new minister, mm. new, new initiatives. Anyway, I went to see Sajid Javid, and he's totally behind it. In fact, what he said was, um, not only am I behind Matt's effort to improve hospital food, but I wanted to go faster and do better, and if you want any, anything more you want, let me know. So at the moment, I've got high hopes for hospital food, and if the Department of Health can finally realize that the un, the good food matters maybe the department of education will because if we want to crack obesity mm. and we want to crack the rich poor divide we have to start by making sure poor people know how to cook understand good food and most of all like eating it mm. and you know how to make children like eating um, healthy food is for them to grow it and cook it and mm -hmm. learn about it and it's interesting and taste it.
I, I want to throw it open to audience mm. questions at this moment, but just one, one final point on, on that, because it is a very serious subject which we all care, care a lot about. Um, taxation works, though, doesn't it? I mean, well you, if, you, if you tax sugar and mm. certain drinks, uh, you find that people switch to other things. So, we, uh, uh, Let me just tell you that, the, that Henry Dimbleby, who's the guy who is behind the chefs in schools, um, charity I was telling you about, and also who founded Leon, which mm -hmm. is a really good chain of sort of good family food. He has just done for Michael Gove uh, a review or strategy. It's called the National Food Strategy, and it's about food in this country. And you know what? It's the first government report I've ever read that I've thought was written by a journalist. You know, it was, it's really well written. It's easy to, to read. And if you just read the the, the, the recommendations. It's fantastic. And his main recommendation, or one of them, is that um, junk food, um, I'm shorthanding junk food, but basically manufactured products that are full of fat and sugar should be hugely heavily taxed. And that money should go into educating poor people and um, deprived um, communities in providing cookery lessons, subsidizing vegetables and, and healthy food, um, helping schools do what we all know they should do, that that money, which is millions and millions of money, uh, billions in fact, could go into that. Guess what? Government not, doesn't not like happening. it. It's not gonna happen, not gonna happen. It is a very, but it is a very, very interesting idea, which yeah. is that you tax something which is bad for people because we do it with cigarettes, we do it with alcohol, mm. uh, we do it with petrol, mm. not bad for you, but it's bad for you. And spend the money on fixing And spend the it on other things. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Mm. And I wonder exactly. if it would ever catch on. Mm. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, it's so upsetting because I think that that was, that was the, most, um, the best chance we had of really turning them. But it, it's still there. Let's, let's, let's bring up the lights and uh, have some questions, please, from, from the audience, because I know there'll be plenty on the areas we've not covered. I uh, hope I can see. Um, Colleague, we've got a some... a lot of you. We, we've, <laughs> we've got some... Yes, yeah, so there's a lady over there. Uh, let's see who... And just maybe a couple more could stick up hands on that other side so we can get some there's microphones to you. There's a lady there first and... Yep, lady there. Somebody over there and there's a gentleman and a lady over on that side. So, go ahead. And you were mentioning that poor people sh should be educated and talked to. Did, did you not say that? that yeah, I did say that, but and it was probably ta tactlessly put. But I'm I myself I don't have that problem. But I'm very concerned that people just cannot afford to eat, and it's maybe not necessarily um, education, but maybe they don't have the money to I agree. to buy food. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. But. In the end, if, if we want everybody to be able to eat healthily, then one of the most important things is they, they need to be able to turn cheap ingredients into healthy, delicious food. And how many of us can do that? It's a really only a sort of band of people who learned cookery at school or, mu or their mums taught them or their dads taught them. But it's, it's not the way we, this society is working. So. My solution to the problem is, is education in the end, but it's how to deal. You know, for, you take um, some of the things that we don't eat anymore. Um, in Middle Eastern countries, the main dish is often a, a mixture of grains. It could be millet or barley or, or spelt or, or cheap grains. But with onions and garlic and um, perhaps chickpeas or these these are not expensive ingredients. Now they're not they're not ingredients we ever buy. I struggle to find them. I mean they they're now because in supermarkets are getting more foodie. You can get you can get them in a good big supermarket. But I mean, how are you going to get people who haven't got much money? to eat healthily if the of course they you know of course you eat pot, pot noodles and and um, um, inexpensive junk 
if that's all you can afford. Of course you do. So the answer is, A, well, I, we've been through the, the well, well, what let's, I think is the answer. This, the, another lady over there, and then there's a gentleman here and a lady there. Um, I was wondering, uh, what cuisine do you enjoy cooking the most, and is that the same one that you enjoy eating the most? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you enjoy cooking the most, or what cuisine do you enjoy cooking the most, and is that the same as the one that you enjoy eating the most? Well, um, I know what you eat. Uh, but you told me oysters. You're an oyster yeah, addict. I, you know, I am an oyster addict. I, I do absolutely love oysters. I just, we just went to Whitstable. I mean, I couldn't get this close to Whitstable and not go and eat oysters. <laughs> so that's what we did for lunch. Um, so, no, I don't think it, they are necessarily the same. Um, but and and I and I like different things all the time. I mean, people often ask me what what would be your favourite meal if you you know if, if your last meal or what's your favourite meal? And it always depends what I had at lunch. <laughs> and and I but I like almost every food. There's hardly a thing that I wouldn't um, like to eat, mm. except I honestly don't because I I suppose I wasn't brought up on it. I I I really hate cheap junk. I mean mm. I I. I can't, there are lots of things that I wouldn't eat ever. Um, but what I like to cook is I love cooking, this is, you know, you're going to think this, I'm very pie, but I, my, what I like cooking is leftovers. Yeah. I absolutely <laughs> love it. It's the mean Scott in me, you know. I like to make something out of nothing. And so I love making mm -hmm. Things out of leftovers. Well, so, so I'm trying to imagine. So you open the fridge and go, "What have we got?" You don't yeah. have a big idea, no, and then no, no. You, yeah. Most oh, of no, what I, I do is I open the fridge, and and that's because I know what goes with what, and I and I'm a well trained cook. I I, mm. I think my mother was a terrible cook, absolutely revolting cook, <laughs> and and she she used to say things like, "Oh, I'm sorry, darling. I'm sure you won't enjoy this." But, I've just made a little slew jaw for lunch. She called it a slew jaw. And what it was, was all her leftovers in the fridge mixed up together in a frying pan. And, and the point is, she had no idea what goes with it. What, and she couldn't resist putting everything in. So it was pretty foul. Awful. Yes, a couple of there. There's a gentleman there and the, uh, a lady behind. If you get it to the gentleman, maybe. Through my questions on uh, food in the USA, actually, um, not too sure how much experience you have with that, but really it's a massive country and a very influential one. Yet my experience having lived there, so on, so for example, states like Wisconsin, where they grow a huge amount of uh, grass and uh, the cows produce fantastic milk, what do they do with their cheese? They process it. And there's the, the, the huge mass of what they call the flyover states between New York and, the, and San Francisco and LA, where really it's my experience is very difficult to find good food. And I really had to go into the center of San Francisco with a client who took me to a good restaurant before I actually got um, you know, a decent meal. Um, would you care to comment on that? Yes, we could. Well, I think, uh, if you like, America uh, are in advance of us in the bad food steaks. I mean, they, they have junk food. There's more of it. More people eat it. Their population is um, more obese than ours. They have less. I'm, I'm just at the moment translating a tiny little cookbook that will come out at Christmas. Please buy it. It's called Bliss on Toast, and it's just that's what it is: stuff on toast. And I'm, I, I'm just having it um, Americanized for the American market, and it is absolutely amazing what they cannot get. You know, simple things. Um, so. Yes, I, I mean, I think the, the Americans, everything being very extreme, their top restaurants are amazing, and their specialist restaurants are fantastic. I mean, if you go to Maine and eat, and eat lobsters, fantastic. If you, go to, um, you know, if you go to a New York deli and you eat a New York deli sandwich, it'll be the best you've ever had. Or, you know, um, of course they're good at specialist stuff, but by and large, I'm with you. I think the diet of the average American is worse, if you can believe it, than the diet of the average Brit. Much worse. Mm. 
I remember in a restaurant in Iowa asking, do you have any vegetables? And I was told, we have cottage cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you Which, are. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody's ever asked for it, apparently. <laughs> um, yes, there was uh, somebody else over there. Yes, go ahead. Um, what is your opinion on veganism? Oh, what is your opinion on veganism? And also, oh, is the future veganism. vegetarian? Is one of the questions okay. that came in. Right. Well, uh, this is look. I, you know, this is all pretty serious stuff. Um, I am a great uh, admirer of vegans and indeed of vegetarians. I used to be um, uh, one, um, once my restaurant, which was by far uh, certainly not a, a vegetarian restaurant, in one vegetarian restaurant of the year, because my sister in law, who who was vegetarian, said to me one day. Um, why do you always serve? Um, I can't, uh, she always ate the same thing. She'd just ask the waiter, tell the chef to make me something vegetarian. But she would never look at the menu. And I said, but we have lots of vegetarian stuff on the menu, why don't you look at that? And she said, I don't want to see the vegetarian options on the same page as the pink calves liver and the suckling pig. You know? And I suddenly realized, you know, vegetarians have a hard time in an, in a carnivores restaurant mm -hmm. because you know they're vegetarians because they don't want to think about that stuff so then we decided to have a separate vegetarian menu and that was hugely successful and what I discovered was 25% of our customers and I'm talking about the 1980s 1990s this was long before vegetarianism was a big deal 25% um, of them were eating off the vegetarian menu because sometimes carnival, can't, well, you've all been to parties where there's somebody does a single dish for the vegetarians and lots of dishes for the carnivores, and then the carnivores eat the vegetarians' dish as well. <laughs> so, so I sort of began to have more sympathy for vegetarians, and, and I've always loved veg, and I've, you know, and so, so vegetarian, I think. When um, the sort of vegan trend started, I really didn't sort of believe in it at the beginning because I thought, I, I suppose I'm talking about 25 years ago or something, if people came to our restaurant and said that they were vegan, I would really worry because I'm not quite sure what that really meant. And I couldn't believe you had to make food without any animal protein. But of course, you can, and it can be absolutely delicious. And now it's much better than it was because there are vegan substitutes that aren't too bad. Ten years ago, they were pretty terrible, but now they're much better. And also, things that... Are not that have always been vegan have become um, really widely used for other purposes. Like, I mean, I don't know how many of you are vegan, but I expect many of the students are at least, because the younger generation tend to be more vegan than, than mine, certainly. But things like hummus, differently treated, can be really replace mayonnaise or make a really good vegan dish, vegan um, creamy dairy-like, if I dare say it, su substitute. Well, it's not a substitute, it's its, its own thing and much better. And, and, and I'll often now use hummus anyway because it's healthier and it's, and it's delicious. So I, I, and I think we, we could, the carnivore should be grateful to vegans because the more vegans there are, the healthier the planet will be. And the more vegetarians there are, and the more and the less meat we eat, the, be the better off we'll be. So, for but, but in terms of is the future vegetarian? And I've got a, a, a friend who's vegan who says, you know, there will come a time, maybe in a generation, where we'll look back on it and think, why did people eat meat at all? Why did they bother? Why um, did they bother to, to which, eat meat? To which I usually say, because some of us like the taste. Well, with science right. around, you can probably get the taste without, without mm. any meat. And, and, and I, think, I don't think that'll happen, because I think some of us like animals. I mean, like seeing them in the fields, and like raising cattle, and like, you know, they just like the whole animal thing. Um, but I, so I don't think veganism will take over the world, but it will certainly become so mainstream that nobody will object to it. And they jolly well shouldn't object to it because none of us should object to the idea of veganism because it's so important that we eat less meat, less protein. Some less more questions. Meat. There's a gentleman there, a uh, lady and gentleman over there. Yeah. 
We didn't talk about insects. We didn't talk about insects. Uh, they're really not vegan. Good. They're not vegan, though. They're not vegan, but perhaps they're not at all vegan. I, I agree, but they are a really good source of protein and a cheap way of getting protein. Right. But do, do, I mean, they're insects, so. Yeah. yeah. Are well, you, I mean, I don't know quite what to say. No, What's you can make. Um, no, but you. you, you I, I promise you, in, you're talking about in 10 years' time. I'm right. thinking about you know, in 10 years' time, there'll be far more vegans, but. The, we, many of us will eat more insect products. I mean, if you think that half the world eats insects anyway, and we eat relations of insects, I mean, did you, I mean, if you put a prawn, if you put a louse, a louse under a microscope, it looks exactly like a prawn. <laughs> and we eat prawns. I mean, okay. we eat prawns. Louse cocktail coming to a restaurant near you. <laughs> Look, are you've probably already eaten. I probably have, the, actually. I mean, the, a I lot of um, crickets are made into um, mm, a flour, I so you, you can incorporate it in breads and in biscuits. And, in, and it, because it's high protein and um, so healthy, I mean, you know, you, we all need protein one way or another. Um, so I think it'll end up in things like, um, uh, dare I say it, hospital food, or I'm not recommending this, I think. <laughs> But, but and, um, you know... Um, right. Well, we've got that to look forward to. <laughs> there was Shepherd's a pie will Shep have <laughs> crickets in it. Hi there. Yes. Um, I, my organisation, I work for an organisation called Dimensions, and we support a lot of people with learning disability, and we do a lot of things around healthy eating and that. But when looking at some of the cooking programmes, th there's not that much for, for people with learning disabilities to understand an easy uh, ingredients and things like that. So I suppose one of the things I'm vlogging is as would Bake Off be looking to, because as far as I know there's been no one with a disability or a learning disability on, on the show. Did you watch the last programme? No, I didn't. You need to. There was that. A yeah, wonderful I girl, an absolutely mm. wonderful girl. There's certainly enough done around the people who learn in disability, around easy ingredients, easy menus, things like that. That's a good point, isn't well, it? It is in a general, good point. It is a very good point. And, uh, and I think, I, I do think that Bake Off tries quite hard to, um, uh, to, to make sure that we have as diverse uh, uh. bakers as possible. But it is also true that their first consideration is to find the 12 best bakers they can. So what they do, it's quite interesting, is they, you know, something like thousands of people apply to Bake Off, 17,000 or something did, um, applied one year, I remember being told the numbers. And they, they're filtered down. And then when they're about 500 or something, then they start to make sure that we, that there are enough, um, you know, that, that all the boxes are getting ticked. Mm. That you, we we don't have a, an all um, we don't have all women or all men or all white or all Asian or something, and also um, dis disabilities. And I mean, I think one of my favourite um, um, favourite um, um, contenders was a f about four years ago. An absolutely wonderful girl who had only she had been she had only one hand. Do you remember? Yeah. I've forgotten her name. What can you remember of her name? Damn it all. That's Bryony. Bryony. Quite right. And Bryony, she was absolutely amazing because she was. Um, uh, you'd think cooking it would be really difficult, but she she didn't want any extra help. She didn't want. Mm. She, and we've had lots of people in wheelchairs and they, and they don't want it to be helped because they don't want, they never want it mentioned in a way. They just want to be part of the, of the show. They, they, they want to just be bakers like everybody else. And I'm so impressed with them because they, I've never known any of them, you know, no special pleading. Nobody's mm -hmm. ever said. Just to let you know, I wouldn't, I'm a rubbish cook. <laughs> I was going to say, are you one of the 17,000? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, who's got the microphone? Next. Yeah, go ahead. 
Thanks. Um, so you have mentioned that we kind of don't have a great relationship with food anymore. And I think it is kind of the plight of the busy, busy person of our younger generation especially. Um, but as, especially it's um, a really difficult time for people to find the time to make and enjoy food. Um, often, but my, both my parents worked, um, worked a lot. And there's one thing an 11-year-old is going to do, and it's put turkey dinosaurs in the oven for their younger siblings to eat. Um, but even throughout university, you know, I was doing a full-time degree, so working three part-time jobs to like actually just survive, and it made it meant I had such a really awful relationship with food. So, what would your advice be to the busy, busy person of today to just sit down and enjoy their meal? It's really hard, isn't it? Mm. I, That's I, a very good question. I think it's a really good question. But, you know, um, you may not like this answer, but there are there have been some recent studies about just how much time we do spend on d various things. And we all spend far too much time on our screens. I mean, if you wanted to get... I think the average time that ch children spend on on screens is about four hours a day. Mm. Well, it ought to be possible to take 20 minutes off that and sit down and have supper. It ought to be possible. And I, I agree it's particularly difficult for working young mum, working young couples, because I think they are probably not spending quite so much time on their screens. And they are running from work to, um, you know, Commuting and then shopping and then cooking and and so forth and I, I do I don't have a, I don't have the answer for it, but overall I think the excuse of no time is because it's a choice of what you spend your time on, and I want everybody to learn to love food and I think food can be an absolute pleasure and, and something that that is quite fun to cook. Together. Well, I was going to say, we've only got a minute or two left, mm. but that, I think that is a really interesting question because it comes up very often that people, people feel pressured uh, for time. But cooking for many people can also be a relaxation. Mm. It's not the end point. It's actually mm. the journey. Mm. It's doing it. It's making the flatbread or doing yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. That yeah, maybe exactly. if perhaps if, uh, if actually the act of cooking, never mind the eating, we all, we all do that. Yeah. But if the act of cooking, which is clearly enjoyable for the people who do Bake Off, except is made But ultimately it's a obvious. choice, isn't it? It, it? Ultimately it's a choice. What, how do you spend your time? And I don't think anybody will ever choose um, to, to cook or to eat well if they don't love it. And they won't love it if they haven't learnt it at school. So I come back to my original thing, mm. let's teach our children to cook. Now, Prue will be signing copies of her books uh, outside at the end. Uh, all that's left for me to say is to thank you very much, Prue, for your time. Thank you for coming. I hope we've all learned something. And please show your appreciation for Dame Prue. <laughs>